in this series, you will be learning the deeper meanings of the 78 tarot cards. I'll be using the Rider Waite Smith tarot tradition and approaching things from the lens of Hermetic Kabbalah, meaning I will be looking at the broader archetypal strokes of meaning within each card. From there, you can deduce your own more specific meaning for divination or stare further into the abyss of this amazing mystical philosophy. You can take this information and apply it to any tarot deck or any number system, really. Um, and I invite you to use this as a study guide, but also as a meditation. You might choose to rewatch the videos or listen to them with your eyes closed and seeing how the ideas land intuitively in the alpha state, in the astral, etc. I'm super excited to share this with you. If you enjoy this material, please subscribe and hit the notification bell for upcoming courses, classes, and live events, and feel free to share. Much love. Get your notebooks out because we're starting with the fool. And the fool is the idea of nothingness. Now, any great mystical tradition has an idea of nothingness, which is literally an oxymoron, because how can you have an idea of nothingness? The very concept of nothingness is a paradox, and that's the point, and that's why he's the fool. He is both laughing at our attempts to penetrate the mysteries, while also kind of egging us on as we take a leap of faith off this ground into the occult. The fool is the folly and nerve and pure spontaneity of the universe to exist and the purity of not having reason. This is important. This is a very, very widespread, very ubiquitous concept in almost every tradition of mysticism. This idea of folly, lunacy, spirituality, and pure no-thingness. From this no thingness, there comes something, which is the magician. The magician is thought itself, but not necessarily in the plane that we understand and experience it. We might compare this to the Greek logos, which is like the will of the universe or the intelligence behind the cosmos as it's growing and creating. We might compare the relationship of the fool and the magician to the Hebrew Eheye, esher, eheye, I will be what I will be, where I am that I am. This is force in all of its ways, but specifically the mind, but also the larger mind discussed in the Corpus Hermeticum. Okay. The priestess is the consort to the magician. So if we have a mind, that a large mind of consciousness itself, pure awareness, this would be the subconsciousness. This would be the marrying flow of the un the married flow of the unknown that accompanies pure awareness, which we might say is divine unawareness. So, if we're watching a movie and there's this uh, technique where part of it's blurred and part of the screen is clear, and then it switches, the clear part of the screen or the picture would be the magician, and the blurred, unclear part, the unknown, would be the high priestess. Together they create possibility because if everything is known there would be nothing there would be no movement no exploration No journey no discovery no wonder uh, No curiosity as in the fool um, But if everything was unknown there would be perfect Indescribable nothingness notice that the fool is both of these things the fool is both knowing all of it and knowing none of it at the same time Which is a divine paradox the holy fool while the mat magician and the high priestess are this binary of known and unknown that is divided from the fool, which is our divine zero. Okay, let's move forward. So we have this magician, high priestess, consciousness and subconsciousness, which come together to form imagination itself, but still not just our imagination on the human scale, but the, the imagination of the cosmos, the large mind. So with the ability of the cosmos to know itself with the magician, to concentrate, to focus, to have awareness, which is also skill and all of the other more superficial meanings, that dancing with the unknown of the high priestess creates the ability of imagination. 
because imagination is the journey between the known world and the, subcon the subconscious deductions we make about that known world and how we project those subconscious deductions onto the unknown. And that is the realm of the Empress. In this sense, psychologically, she is pure fertility of the imagination in the same way that she is fertility of the earth and the divine mother. Now, she is followed by the emperor. When all of this imagination becomes organized into, let's say, language, names, forms, um, structures, boundaries, that is the realm of the emperor. Now, something really interesting happens here, and I want to talk about gender. Gender in tarot, and this is a big thing I'm starting to be, I'm talking about a lot more with my students and people that have been emailing me. Gender in tarot, gender, the idea of gender in tarot decks, the tarot traditions that we follow today is obviously very outmoded. And so there's a lot of talk of like, how do we incorporate gender identity with these old traditions? And my current way to kind of cope with these outmoded gender expressions is to look at them as almost like caricatures of archetypes in the sense that drag, like, like the art of of drag, a drag queen, is itself a characteristic of gender. It's part of gender and an aspect of gender, but not the entire, the entirety of gender. It is an expression. And so that's kind of how I've been using the tarot to express the parts in, of me and the different gender energies within me. But there's a zigzag effect. There's this ricocheting effect between gender and force and form because we like to simplify things and say there's masculine energy and there's feminine energy. But when you really study Hermetic Kabbalah, you see that, and even I think um, Jewish Kabbalah, you see that the genders really bounce off from each other and that it, they constantly incorporate things from the other side, almost to the point where they're indistinguishable. So form is classically attributed to the feminine while force is attributed to the masculine. But yet here, even in the Empress, we have the force of the imagination and the flowing river of possibility and growth and fertility. And then we have the form, the concretized form of the Emperor influencing and putting, projecting this matrix upon the flow of reality. That in itself contradicts our typical association. So notice that dance between gender. But now that we're starting to project our, let's say we, put the world into calculus. We put the curvy, weird, flowing reality of all sensations, experiences, and waves and particles into this neat grid of understanding, whether that's language or literally maps or architecture. We put it into meter, which Alan Watts compares to matter. Materialization is really just putting it into meter, is really just measuring. That allows us the sense of time, tradition, culture, and more specifically, a sense of belonging and relatability. And that is the realm of the Hierophant. So the Hierophant comes in and joins things together through history, through time, through association. Spiritually, he is the juncture between matter and spirit. Because by the point of the, by the time we get to the emperor, we have really succeeded in developing some level of separation, an illusion of separation. The illusion of separation is another ubiquitous idea in all mysticism and spirituality. Um, and it's not about destroying the illusion, it's about integrating the illusion of separation into the world that we're creating for ourselves, which in itself is an art and an alchemical process. Um, but anyway, the Hierophant comes in and because we have these this illusion of separation through the grid that is created by the emperor here, we can now, we now, the channel to spirit is revealed to us. Before there was no need of a channel to spirit, like an antenna to spirit, because it was all just mush of imagination and fertility. But this channel as differentiated from what we are creating from ourselves in our projected virtual realities, whether that's you know architecture, language, all of our inventions, our society, etc., that in itself, the man-made world, which is very much physical and psychological, that gives form to a channel to spirit that didn't have form before. 
And that form, that channel to spirit, that connection to truth that we all have underlying all the virtual reality that we project is itself the Hierophant. Now, another result of the illusion of separation slash the birth of ego or the primordial ego is the lover's card, is the ability to behold another. The, the reason why you can look at this video and feel like it's coming out of something that's not you is the lover's card. In the same way that I can look at this camera, it is my ability to look at someone and love them and behold them as something slightly different from me, slightly unknown, but beautiful, but interesting. Um, this is literally like existentially, the lover's card is space itself in a way, distance between things, which is another thing we are projecting upon the flowing reality from the emperor, okay? The lovers is um, also recognizing that what you behold is you, and that's kind of the mystery. So yeah, the lovers is specifically, if we're looking at things in the creative process of the universe, the lovers is fractalization through separation, or any form of creation through separation. So like cells dividing and planetary bodies dissolving and coming together, that's all the realm of the lover's card. Um, yeah. The chariot card is the fusion of all things before it. So it is in a way a manifestation of life itself. And the chariot has a lot of things on the tree of life. It's very connected to the left side of the tree, which is the feminine side, which is where the the blood and water of life is pouring out, like the ability to incarnate. So the chariot is really talking about incarnation as an experience, um, which requires beholding of otherness, uh, relatability, uh, history, culture, projected language and man-made inventions, imagination, all the things before it. So this is the result, which is a life. And it's not the master of life, but it is the adept of life. It is ability, it, it's kind of like the bottom tatwas of, um, of Eastern philosophy. It's all the things that are required to have a human experience, um, to survive, to communicate, to, to exist. And the chariot represents incarnation as a vehicle for the soul, as something fun that we drive around. And it's like our bodies are kind of like our, these meat sacks that we pull around energetically from our consciousness. Um, you don't have to, and by the way, you don't have to believe any of this stuff because belief is just a tool. Um, if anything, just let the ideas tickle your brain and have fun with them. Um, but yeah, chariot is vehicle of the soul, which is our bodies are also our personalities, but more deeply, it goes into the, the layers of our energy bodies as well, um, which gets very complicated and beautiful, but, um, yeah. So now that we have incarnation and we have this Russian doll template of energy bodies, which is kind of what it looks like. The, the, um, the energy bodies are like Russian dolls. There's multiple layers. Some are harder, some are softer, and they kind of alternate, uh, and then they go outwards. Now that we have this energy body and this incarnated experience, the strength card comes in, and this is our ability to manipulate that energy. The strength card is specifically the manipulation of the creative energy, which can denote the kundalini serpent power that's wrapped up at the base of the spine and through yoga and esoteric practice, you can draw it upwards to the top of the head and draw this ojas energy and have an awakening eventually. Um, and a lot of that is what the tarot is expressing, but that's only, that's one very deep layer. There are many other layers as well. More generally, strength is the manipulation of energy as a whole, with the roses signifying um, the magic chain and the lion signifying desire and um, the kundalini, the lion serpent and fortitude. There's a lot of Renaissance uh, influence in this as well. Um, but yeah, in a way she reflects the ability of the magician, which in itself is a channeling of energy by awareness itself is channeling all existence to be aware this is a chat this is channeling awareness to manipulate energy on a more uh, specific scale like a human scale cool so the hermit card is when we have 
manipulated energy enough to either ascend as the hermit or behold the hermit in his majesty, in his lofty place of awareness. Um, the hermit is light, and this is actually, an, not a lot of people will believe me, but this is an image of God, big quotes here, but it is an image of God. And that has to do with its Kabbalistic associations, but the hermit is really our ability to see a beacon of hope, which is ultimately someone, some intuition, maybe it could be a prophet, a yogi, just a really loving person, or any figure that illumines the potential of our uh, spiritual awareness, which is really cool. And I really think that the lantern, like fire, it's spiritual awareness spreads because high energy drips down to low energy and it's infectious and it will find you. It will find you. Um, but you know what it's like when you're around somebody with such a high vibration and they just change your world. Uh, that's kind of what the hermit is, re is representing among many other deep things. Now, the, the Wheel of Fortune is kind of what the hermit himself, herself, is experiencing or what they are beholding. And that is all the laws of the material and the spiritual universe. Now, the Wheel of Fortune is specifically more geared, geared towards the material laws, but by beholding all the material laws as happening at once, which they are, you know, read the Kabbalion, read anything, read, I don't know, thermodynamics, just read anything about laws, when you can behold them all happening in this intricate dance of the machinery of the universe, that in itself is a mystical experience. And there's totally a backdoor here to go into Ezekiel and um, uh, Merkaba mysticism and all of that. Uh, but yeah, this is beholding the law, which is what Ezekiel did in a way he beheld, he saw this throne of God and God ultimately, and some other cool, some other cool stuff, lots of eyes. Yeah, that's a common thing in, um, in uh, apocalypticism and also um, psychedelics, which is interesting, and near-death experiences, lots of beings with lots of eyes. Um, I've been fixated on that a little bit lately, but because um, this is also the eye of Shiva, which is in a sense closed while everything is moving and will be destroyed when it's open. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of other, I'm not going through all the symbols. We would literally be here for years, um, but I'm just giving you kind of a, that, that deeper level. So justice is actually our karma card, and it is the way that these laws uh, flow into our life. It is this, this large macrocosmic uh, system of laws, you know, rhythm, polarity, all of those things, um, scale, correspondence, how all these laws begin to affect us in our microcosm, which in itself is its own world. Because you're literally in your own world, and just like God, the source, chaos, Krishna, whatever, created the whole universe, you are creating your personal Y.O. universe, and that, and the card that describes the rhythm of that creation is justice. Why justice? Because of action and reaction. Karma is not this righteous, I don't know, thing of um, punishment and consequence. It is literally cause and effect. It can happen at like 270 miles per hour which I think is the speed at which your brain sends signals to your body. It's the psycho-cybernetics of how we react to life. It's like cognitive behavioral therapy. It's how we react to life. It's how we, um, it's the psycho-cybernetics of the body-mind working together. So it's what we create for ourselves, what we do, how we react to that, and how we put that into the story of who we are and how that affects our behavior to either reinforce that what we're creating or go against it and that is not always an easy process because we're all growing we're all learning we're all healing in one way or another we're all turning lead into gold and that the the tension and the learning and the work and the refining happens through karma and justice um and then the results of that sometimes are the hanged man Hanged Man is a very, very deep card. Another card we could talk about for days and days. But mostly it's about the surrendering 
to the karmic rhythm, which in itself releases a lot of karma. Um, because what you're doing in the hanged man, the hanged man is describing this complete surrender to the logos, to the intelligence of the universe, to the will of the universe. The light coming out of the head here has to do with LVX and has to do with the logos, the light of divine intelligence, which is itself an expression or radiation from our hermit card. Um, there's a lot of numerology with this card and geometry with his body and, and deep connections to the Empress and the, uh, the world card. Um, but generally, it's, it is a card of the dying god formula, a.k.a. Osiris, Christ, Buddha. We love a coming-of-age story. We love a transcendent death and rebirth story. That's very much about the hangman. The hangman is the method in, in, a, in a way the descent into darkness, which in itself could be incarnation itself in order to redeem something spiritual. So in a sense, it's like our incarnations are literally the method through which the universe cleanses itself, renews itself, and, and even knows itself. And by surrendering to that process, we are entering the, the realm of the hanged man. Um, very deep card. Um, death, very deep card as well, but also it's just death. Death literally as the dying process, um, but also movement. Um, the beauty of death, a lot of its symbols connect to movement, flexibility, and liquidation. It's Scorpio, the Hebrew letter noon, which is fish. Um, it has ideas connected to walking and ambulation. And it's just very much about death being the requirement for all phenomena to continue and to move. Um, I always think of it like sensations come always in a wave. For a sensation to exist, there has to be an, a, uh, an onrush, a commencement, uh, an apex, and then a recession, and then a silence. Like those four things are required if you want to map it out that way, which is also the Wheel of Fortune. But the death is the ability of the movement of it, which allows it to exist in the first place. So what's happening here is, in a way, when we go look at these watery cards, because um, death is connected to Scorpio, a lot of the watery cards are energy issuing forth from the priestess, that unknown element becoming known in some way, or that unknown element kind of lubricating the motion of the universe, that water of the priestess, the water of the death card, the water of the chariot, this life water, which is also death, um, the fluidity of the two, the dance of the two, which allows experience to exist and allows things to continue to change and allows us to be creators. Because to be creators, how are we going to create if everything's just brittle and staying the same all the time? Um, this goes from, from a cosmic perspective, but also to a human perspective. That flow continues in the temperance card, and this is kind of like the recovery answer to that. Um, temperance is also more deeply the the flowing relationship between our conscious awareness and subconscious. So I mentioned the priestess. This is kind of like the priestess and the magician coming together again and that dance being married in a new way or dancing in a new rhythm. And that rhythm is literally depicted as the water between the two cups. Um, ironically, this is a card that she's standing on land and water, but it's very much a card of fire being Sagittarius. And all the symbols with this card from Sagittarius to the Hebrew letter Samak to pretty much everything have to do with the extremes and the tension between extremes, which allows one to move forward, which allows one, one to progress. Um, a very literal experience of the temperance card is to walk forward, what, like literally just walk. The resistance of the earth to you walking and your pressure on the earth and gravity, all of those is what allows you, is what propels you forward. So it's like divine resistance, vibration, which allows things to happen. Uh, the devil card brings all this together. So the devil card is the tension behind the illusion of fixity, especially in contrast to the world, which is always flowing and moving. So there's two aspects of the devil card, and so many tarot readers see the devil as this addiction and all that, and that's great. That, that's a level, but um, that level, the, the shadow self, the addiction, the illusion, all of that is what has been usefully provided to us through our evolution through the other cards that I've been talking about, most notably the emperor. Um, what happens in the devil is it's more about 
um, integrating that illusion or noticing that's, that it's an illusion, um, especially in contrast to all the other cards that we just went through, the death, the hanged man, uh, temperance, all of these things with, which have to do with flow, vibration, surrender, um, surrendering to this life force and, and realizing these elements of illusion. When, when we can surrender while still living in, for lack of a better word, the matrix, which is our projection of our virtual realities that society has conditioned us to think is so, et cetera, et cetera, which is also useful, that tension between the two and integration of the two is the devil. Because um, the devil is also our will to live. It's also our sex and our desire nature, which isn't inherently bad, but when we project all this bullshit on it, it can be pretty distracting. So it's the integ integration of the two. It's drawing the lower nature into the higher nature, which we have been primed to do by the temperance, uh, conscious and subconscious, above and below, all of that. Now, as we go into the tower card, this is, you know, the most fun card of the deck because this is our first real spiritual illumination. Um, it is the first moment when we actually do suspend the matrix that we are projecting on the world from the devil. And there are so many symbols that I'm not going over here, but like the chains, the half cube of space, the, the torch directing downwards, the Saturn symbol, all these symbols in one way or another have to do with half truth, illusion, matrix, not inherently bad, but definitely illusion. And when we exit the matrix, we're like Neo, you know, in the matrix. And we kind of, we don't have a very happy awakening. That's the tower. Um, anyone that talks about ego death, um, I don't know. Most ego death that I see people talk about, I don't think is real ego death. Because it's, um, there's no words for it. You can't talk about it. Like to actually have a true ego death. There's nothing you can say, um, at least for mine. There's no way I could. That's why I, have, I don't talk about it much is because there's literally no way I could possibly describe the experience. So I try. And I think everyone's going to eventually have one anyway in one life or another. Um, but I guess the tower tries to describe it. Um, this is a spiritual influx. Uh, in one interpretation, this is the energy going to the top of the head and uh, reaching the third eye and the pineal gland which is also hinted at in the sun card and other cards. Um, but really, this is just a complete destruction of the projection that I've been talking about so much that we put onto reality, which, again, I will say is useful, but has to be integrated with everything else. And in a way, that is the alchemical process, integrating imagination, our consciousness with our evolutionary past and nature itself and all of that. But that's probably another video. Um, so the tower is falling head first, an influx of spiritual information coming into the head and uh, letting go of, of this tower of false science. I'm, I'm quoting Paul, uh, Paul Foster Case a lot with this one. Um, but yeah, it's Mars and it's the, the destruction of ego. Um, and I will say that one thing, since my ego death, um, and by the way, when I say ego death, like you have an ego death, but you come back. like. My ego is the one talking right now. So it's like not like, oh, it's gone. It's like you need it. Um, or it's an illusion, but it's a technology. Uh, but anyway, one thing that I've experienced in my tower moment was following it. Um, I've had blissful moments of the, the only way I can describe it is space itself. And even that is like a stain on the experience. It's, that doesn't even cover it. But I feel like the star card kind of really illustrates that because the star is when the tower is gone and there's just a the sky, there's all this possibility. So the star is um, the star is kind of the rebuilding of the nervous system post ego death, post spiritual awakening, post um, you know Kundalini experience, post trauma maybe post. A lot of things, but it's we have a lot of symbols like this tree over here symbolizes the brain, and there's symbols of um, the nervous system. But it's it's very much a card of kind of re, like becoming aware of awareness itself again in a new way. And from that, we get ideas of hope, rejuvenation, and healing, all of which happen under this new awareness, under these new stars. Um, one foot on land, one foot on water is one of my favorite symbols in the tarot. I talk about it a lot, but it's like this is the place where we come back to our small selves, having reached a higher self 
and actually get to start balancing the spiritual world, which is ultimately nothing, which is the fool that started this whole process. We balance that with the physical world, which is also our projected physical world, which is the matrix and all of that. Uh, so it's an integrating with the two and it's also a releasing. Um, cool. So having this space itself and kind of coming, coming to terms with this new awareness, there's one more really big hurdle before things get, uh, get fun again, and that is the moon card. And I've actually seen this a lot where people I've talked to have these really intense spiritual experiences that are sometimes traumatic and sometimes blissful, oftentimes both. And then they live blissfully for a time, and then they go back into this sense of, not back, but they get this sense of melancholy um, and this feeling of offness. So they have this feeling of like unsettledness or like the fulfillment that this indescribable fulfillment is now, they're now unfulfilled. Um, and that's really the moon card. And I think what's happening here, according to some sources, is there is literal anatomical changes happening as your body takes on this new spiritual version of yourself, this new quantum update. Um, and I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what's actually happening, but I think as may, whether it's the pineal gland or the brain and the spinal cord, there's, there are just things that the cells change, the body changes, um, and there's kind of a delay. Um, but that's one, one interpretation of, one deeper interpretation of the moon. But another one is it's really our integration of all the life that existed before us because the moon illustrates for us our evolutionary past right we are the single-celled organisms that were birthed in this in the sea that developed into amphibians and eventually crawled on land we have this with the lobster slash crayfish crayfish situation and then um, the, the wolf which is wild eventually into the animal kingdom which is tamed by tamed by humanity into the dog and then eventually humanity is uh, symbolized by these towers. So it's like, I feel like the, the, the moon card is like our inner embarrassment of all the beings and creatures we were before, but esoterically, it's regaining the memory of all the beings we were before, all the animals, all the organisms. And if you read Aleister Crowley's Libra Thisharb, you will see that you need that memory before you cross the abyss according to Crowley. And um, yeah, it's, it's some deep stuff. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of like an integration of, or the beginnings of the integration of our DNA as a code of the entire past, but also of the future, because it's kind of holographic in that way. Um, if you're into hermetic philosophy, it's holographic at least. So the sun card is really like the pineal gland lining up and getting their whole life. Like this is boop, we are there, we are here, we are queer, we are having a good time, and we are just radiating joy. Um, but more specifically radiating the spontaneity that we knew in the fool, which we now kind of um, reintegrate but as an incarnated being. And that's the beauty of it. So it's like we ran this whole gambit of um, you know, coming into being, projecting our virtual realities onto things, experiencing highs, lows, death, change, release, surrender, vibration, da 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 da, um, integrating our past <laughs> uh, species, and now we're like all of it, being like, yeah, like this is this is not. It's just enjoying it. It's like the sheer enjoyment of it. So it's very much a card of innocence, um, and it's a card of integrating the four Kabbalistic worlds. Um, it's a card of it's kind of the best way to describe this card is like all things happening at once, vibration, radiation, consciousness, but without need of anything, but still doing it. So it's not a complete leaving of the matrix. We're still in the matrix. We're just, we really have quite a handle on things through this enormous level of trust and spontaneity and intuition and even in a way impulse. Um, and all of those things, because they're happening so naturally, so organically, so without need, so without attachment, which is constantly flowing, that spiritual nature reflects all spiritual nature. It's kind of like when you, you know, like a child, the way a child looks at the world is like with such a wonder and such purity. 
Um, if you ever meet an adult like that, it's like that truly looks at the world that's so like all the time. Um, I've only met really one. I, my grandmother was, I, for all intents and purposes, woke AF, as the kids say. And she was just always in awe and always laughing and so joyful. And she she was, you know, late 70s, um, but she had the eyes of a child and that was the sun. Because there was wisdom with the joy and spontaneity. It's not just spontaneity. It's not just impulse. It's not just, because there's a level of ignorance with that, as beautiful as it is. It's the wisdom of time and age with the spontaneity, with the awe, with the wonder, with the curiosity. Um, so yeah. Um, and then the judgment card is um, apocalypticism aside. It is really that singularity between this world and not the next like dying but like the the macrocosm in a sense um yeah and what's happening here is they're actually being stretched out of three dimensions into four dimensions or maybe today you might say 4d out of 4d into 5d depending on your template of the universe but um but yeah this is a calling that you can't deny um but even this card there is very much still a death here probably more intense than the death card than the tower but because of the spiritual maturity of the aspirants here it's not a big deal <laughs> because we've hit the sun where we we're, we we are everything at once we're doing everything at once we are in that creative flow in the flow state participating in incarnation but also not of it and that allows us to kind of flow more easily um yeah it's a threshold uh for sure um, Pluto, fire, Hebrew letter Shin, um, the fire letter, the holy letter, 300, it's a big one. Um, so we're moving on from that, and the world is our last card. And the world and the fool are cards that, in a way, they don't, they're like bookends to the process, but they also describe the whole process. So I would say the fool is the only card you ever really need in the tarot. In a way, it's the only card that exists but the world is the full development of the fool on the other side which is also the fool and the idea here is and this is really where things get so cool so crazy is recall i'm talking about things like the eyes of a child spontaneity uh curiosity awe but with wisdom now right the same awe that has developed in, in these last couple cards which is now crystallizing and perfecting itself in the perfectly balanced card that is the world perfectly balanced by our four um, for Beast of Ezekiel, for Cherubim, perfectly balanced by these two pillars, which is also Yachin and Boaz, which is also spiral forces and positive and negative and gender and all those things. The double, the helix of DNA and the womb, and it's all happening right now. This is life and DNA and consciousness all happening right now in the illusion of time, which is only this moment. Because this is the great one of the night of time. It's the Saturn is attributed to this card. Um, but the beauty of this card is that awe is now fully complete and returns to zero. Uh, everything in the universe cancels each other out. All illusion of separation is removed to come back to this ultimate oneness, which is actually nonness. And that very nonness, that very magical awe is the fool. It's the same thing. And then it happens again. And this is the coolest part of tarot because it is the ultimate paradox. And because it is the ultimate paradox and illustrated really cool and really fun to use, um, it makes it a tool of mysticism, which is beyond divination. And that's what I want to get to you, across to you in this video. So that was the majors. I'll have another video for the minors and another video for the court cards. Thank you for tuning into my series on the deeper meanings of the Rider Waite Smith tarot if you enjoyed this please subscribe hit the notification bell so you will be updated on upcoming courses videos and live events or virtual events and feel free to share if you'd like a more thorough education on esoteric tarot or tarot as a profession visit tarotmysticismacademy.com where you can take some more free courses much love and i hope to chat with you soon